Hello, and thank you for joining us for the second episode of the SLW Institute Analytics How To Webinar Series. This episode will examine how to make and use portfolio curation, competitive patent landscape, and SWOT analysis reports. This is the second episode in a five-part series. A recording of the webinar and the slides will be made available to all registrants. Feel free to enter any questions using the Q&A feature in the Zoom menu. We invite you to follow us on LinkedIn to see news about other upcoming webinars. And with that, I'll turn things over to our moderator. Hey, thank you, Michelle, and welcome everybody to today's program. <clears throat> Let me get uh, started here introducing people. So um, first, I'm going to introduce uh, two of the members of our uh, firm's analytics team, uh, Milena Higgins uh, first, who's chief of our data analytics at Schweigman. Milena's got many years in the patent field and in litigation and prosecution in operations. Um, and so we're very glad to have Milena uh, on our team. She's got a PhD in physics. Uh, so she's uh, very well versed in every dimension. And Rob Stans is our other uh, permanent standing member of our analytics team at the firm. And Rob is an analytics specialist who has been doing um, you know, extensive work with all the different analytics tools that uh, you can imagine. Our firm over the years has pretty much worked with every one of them and has licenses to various different tools. Rob is a specialist in using all those tools and also has learned to uh, do uh, a lot of really great uh, independent search work and analytics work so we're happy to have them leading our, our permanent department. Um, let me go back over to Janelle Callis. Janelle has been on uh, other programs with us before. Janelle is a uh, very highly experienced patent attorney, been a partner at the firm for many, many years and does a lot of analytics work. And she's got, uh, her background is chemical engineering uh, and uh, she's represented uh, many different types of clients, but spent a, quite a bit of time representing uh, clients with chemical type of um, backgrounds, but also med tech and mechanical and everything except for, I think she hasn't dabbled in electrical yet and probably will stay away from that. But <clears throat> then we also have today Adil Haroon, who's of counsel to the firm. Adil's got uh, quite a deep background working both in patent litigation and in prosecution. He's worked with a couple of um, the country's, uh, you know, biggest and best uh, law firms before joining Schweigman. We're really glad to have Adil. Adil um, was a patent examiner at, when he was in law school, so he's got some familiarity with all the patent uh, office works. But in addition to that, um, just tremendous experience with uh, litigation and prosecution too. So glad to have Adil with us today. And last but not least, we've got Piers Blewett. Pierce is also a, a long-term industry veteran, not too long because he's still uh, a, a young man, but Pierce has been working for about half his career in private practice and about half his career in corporate practice and has done a lot of uh, strategic counseling for corporate clients and also a lot for our, his clients here at the firm. It does a lot of analytics work. Is, uh, lives out in Silicon Valley and that's where principal client base is. So with that, let me let me uh, roll it to the next slide and we'll kind of jump into this. <clears throat> so I mean we're being, we're going to talk about really two things today. They're very interrelated. Um, you know one is the competitive patent landscape analysis and SWOT analysis. Um, and a deal Arun is going to handle that uh, discussion and then after that, we're gonna just talk about portfolio curation in general, which is uh, organizing your portfolio. And in this case, customized curation or organization built around you know, your own sp specific desires for how you like to look at your patent portfolio. So with that, let's uh, jump to the next slide, please. And again, um, this is basically just a, Another another repeat of the previous slide, more or less. So I think uh, we'll get. Uh, is this ideal? Is this where you start, or is this my slide too? I forget. Um, 
So actually, let me, let me, a deal. Oh, I can start now. Why don't you start out with this one? Yeah, that's good. All right, so we'll be discussing SWOT analysis today. Um, Dan, maybe we can move to the next slide because I think that might be a better starting point. So to begin, we should start by defining what is SWOT. SWOT is a planning technique used by companies and organizations to assess business competition and to assist in their strategic planning. SWOT stands for strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. This presentation is going to focus on conducting a SWOT analysis from an IP or patent perspective. Next slide, please. So what value does a SWOT analysis provide? Well, a SWOT analysis can provide value to an organization in a variety of ways. Not only can you gain insight into your organization's patent position in a particular technology space, but you can also gain insight into your competitor's patent position as well. Plus, SWOT analysis may reveal some threats that you possibly were not aware of. For example, emergence of a new player into a technology space. And lastly, SWOT analysis can help you identify opportunities in a technology space. These may include something like a white space strategy to possibly focus resources directed to unprotected or less protected areas in the technology. Or another example may be partnership opportunities with other players in the technology space where the technology may seem compatible. Next slide, please. So the first question I'm guessing everyone is going to get if they bring up the topic of a SWOT analysis, is how much is it going to cost? Uh, well, he could give you the lawyerly answer, but it really depends. It really depends on the type and scope of the project. Um, for example, one of the variable costs is how much manual review by an attorney is going to be needed. If the project is going to be primarily driven by automated analytics, then the cost will be generally lower. But if the project includes a substantial amount of manual review by attorney of the patents, then the cost will, of course, rise. So um, the cost is generally going to be dependent on the project's scope. Um, and I think the next slide will help with that. So here we've provided an outline of the general process we've used to conduct a SWOT analysis. We'll discuss most, as we'll discuss, most of these steps should be customized based on the project. But at a high level, the SWOT analysis includes about six steps. First, uh, you know, define a scope of the project. Two, uh, develop a search strategy. Three, review the search results. Four, perform the analytics. Five, analyze the results. And six, then conduct the SWOT analysis. In my experience, the first step of defining the project scope um, can prove to be the most difficult and sometimes the most critical. If you don't define the scope correctly in the beginning, the project can grow unwieldy or may become too narrow. In my experience, you know, I've divided a project into smaller sections when it's become too big, where each section would include its own search, review, analytics, and SWOT analysis. And here, if any of the other panelists have any thoughts to share about the process, if they have any, you know, things that they like to do, uh, please feel free to share. Hey, Neil. Yeah, I was just going to add that um, a number of times we will go through and almost repeat steps one through three to make sure we're locking in on the exact patents that they were looking for. Oh, that's a that's a great point. I think that's actually highlighted in the next slide. So maybe it, that gives a good transition to that, the search strategy. Um, I don't think there's a one size fits all strategy when you think of searching. You know, I've generally used some combination of keyword classification and backward forward citation searches. Um, the search will really depend on the technology space. And why I say that is, for example, some technology spaces. Uh, may not be good to add candid, add um, backward forward citations uh, because patents in that area may have you know hundreds or if not thousands of patents um, cited in them 
for example, by applicants in those long IDSs I think we're all familiar with. So backward citations may not be helpful in that particular technology space. And as Rob was saying, I, you know, it's been my experience that the search strategy has been an iterative process. Um, you know, I will try a search and then review the results at a high level. And that will tell me whether I need to broaden the search, narrow the search, or just completely modify it because I'm not getting the right results. You know, I'll go through a few iterations before I really finalize the search. Another thing that, you know, I've done in the past is um, at this stage, get some subject matter experts, for example, from the client side involved to make sure that the search is capturing the right information. Uh, next slide, please. So after you've, you know, conducted and finalized your searching, um, the next step is reviewing the results. Um, like I said before, the review um, in some cases may not involve manual review by an attorney and may be just um, relying completely on automated analytics. Uh, but in my experience, to get the nuanced information you really want and need to do a SWOT analysis, manual review is typically needed. And what I mean by manual review is um, an attorney or an agent uh, would review the PANS at some level. It could be at a high level, for example, just looking at the claims, the title, and the abstract. Or in other cases, it could be reviewing the figures along with you know, a brief review of the specification, um, whatever the project scope demands. So yeah, deal. This is Steve Lundberg here, yeah. and I would just comment on this. Having done a lot of these, the a lot of times you're going to get your initial search if it's if it's a typical one and 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 actually a good one, you're going to get uh, five times more patents than are really relevant, if not even ten. And so the first, at least number of the ones these I've done is the first pass is really just throwing out patents that are just clearly irrelevant, although the keywords matched and the other criteria in the search matched. And that that first pass, you might be going through 60 patents an hour, um, tossing out ones that look like they're completely irrelevant, which often is easy to figure out to get down to the, the core. <clears throat> oh, I agree. I, th I think that should always be the first step. And it's listed here as a relevancy and with the thing of filtering out the noise. Because like you said, um, no search is gonna be perfect. It's not, it's, you know, no search is gonna capture only the type of patents you want. So a quick tagging for relevancy of a patent can really help filter out the noise. Um, and that really helps because if you have a lot of non-relevant information, it could adversely impact the analysis that you're doing because you're not really getting the quality of information you need to do the SWOT analysis. Um, and in my personal experiences, like Steve had mentioned, um, the relevancy review can be just a quick review of the abstract and you know, the first independent claim you know, a quick 30 seconds per pen. Deal, let um, me jump in here for a second. This is Malena. Uh, one of the other things that can be helpful in this step is to also look at your competitors and whether or not they're showing up in your search results. So kind of in that iterative process that you're, you're doing, if you're seeing the players you expect, that's a good sign. Uh, and if you're not seeing the players you expect, maybe it needs another iteration. So I just wanted to add that. Well, that's a great point. Uh, that's, um, that's, I've used that and I've kind of um, used that and sharing that top assignee information with a client and other subject matter experts to really kind of do a kind of a pressure test of the search. This is Janelle and I have a comment regarding uh, searching for design patents. Uh, it presents a, an interesting challenge because Frequently, the title of a design uh, patent is, uh, is just a very simple noun, and it's not very descriptive uh, of what is claimed. So uh, uh, one way that I uh, search uh, in that area is I will use one of those very generic terms or sometimes an assignee search, uh, but uh, what I'll uh, uh, get is uh, uh, a spreadsheet uh, showing only the first drawing of the design patent. And that allows a quick uh, determination of uh, relevancy, especially to filter out the noise. 
very this interesting. Is, this is Piers. Uh, another thing I found <laughs> helpful, um, sometimes this review has to be done in very urgent circumstances, perhaps in litigation or in response to a threat or your CEO wants you to find something that you can throw back against the competition. And when it's sort of all hands on deck situation like that, you may have very experienced people on the team that know what they're looking for or more junior people. And if you're trying to give them more junior people criteria that they can get their hands around quickly, two things you can do are to say, look for detectable stuff. If there's something in there that you just can't tell, like Steve was saying, put it to one side for now. It's going to be too hard to prove that it's there. The other thing you can do, so brute force, is simply look for the claims that look short. Uh, independent claims are less than 50 words. So these are quick ways just to get at something that, that might be useful to you. Hey, Adil, we have a, a couple of questions that came in. Maybe we could just, uh, as long as we're kind of in pausing on this slide a little bit. Um, one question that I'll, I'll uh, take first is, uh, somebody's asked what aspects of the patent are relevant, you know, for a SWOT analysis, only the claims or, or also do we look at non-claim aspects like uh, spec? Do um, you have any thoughts? Anybody have any thoughts on that? Um, so I, when I generally do it, I, I consider them both. Uh, claims would be ranked higher uh, but a lot of times you will have some patterns with these um, large specifications and maybe the search hit on the specification part and not on the claimed part. Uh, so I would rank that a little bit, maybe like a medium relevancy and not a high relevancy, but I still think those would be relevant. That's been my experience. Additionally, this is where, and, and we'll get to it a bit later on, you can mine the specs for... Um... For continuations or targeted apps. Mm -hmm. So that's another area, Steve, yeah. I'd say where, where non-claim stuff can be very helpful. And, and certainly if it's a patent application that hasn't yet been issued, the spec becomes very relevant because it's a possibility of what it can claim, not just what it's actually claimed. Um, another, another question that came in was, is anybody used value added indexing databases where a subject matter expert has indexed the use advantage of the patent. Um, personally, I'm not aware of, of uh, any resources like that, but uh, obviously there are. <laughs> so maybe we can learn more about that uh, and talk about it in a future webinar, but has anybody else ever seen like a supplemented database where an expert has gone through and commented that you can access to help with the SWOT analysis? Steve, I have um, something along these lines in the Alice days, well, we've still got Alice, where someone would go through and kind of rank the claims based on 101 vulnerability. And that was like a prior review by, say, a subject matter expert um, or a, a kind of a, a 101 expert. Which which can kind of help guide um, how to mine the portfolio and so forth. Is that like a a commercial database or just something we did before the <laughs> something we yeah. did? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. okay. I, I guess, guess that makes. I guess Derwent has a product here I'm seeing uh, that does something like that. So um, that sounds cool and be interesting to see more about that. So you want to? You should probably. Uh, I guess get rolling again there, deal, please. No problem. Okay. Um, just one thing to mention on the review strategy and why we have the magnifying glasses. Um, the goal is to obtain useful observations or clues for the SWOT analysis. So you really have to tailor your review strategy that way. Um, so if you're you know, really interested in claim quality or claim type or technology groups, um, set your review strategy accordingly. Um, and we'll show some examples in the next few slides now. So once you've completed the review step and tagged the patterns, if you're doing a manual review, you can uh, use that information in performing the analytics. So here, a landscape analysis can help in, in identifying top players in a technology space, 
uh, key portfolio characteristics, filing trends. Um, here, we're just showing you a gen, uh, like a high level uh, ranking of the top assignees in a particular technology space. Um, you know, th at this high level, it might not provide you much information. So uh, you would want to break that down. So if you go to the next slide, please. So here is the same kind of information uh, broken down by the each company's uh, portfolio according to their status, uh, expired and grand patents, as well as pending and abandoned applications. By breaking the information down at this level, you can really make some useful observations. Uh, for example, here, uh, you can see that ABC Corp has a high rate of abandonment. Um, that's the pink or beige color in the middle. Um, it also has a lot of expired patents when you compare it to the, its number of pending applications here. Um, in contrast, if you look at the last company, the OK company, um, you see that it has no expired patents, uh, a few granted patents, but while most of its portfolio consists of pending applications. So this may indicate that OK company may be a new emerging player in this field. Next slide, please. And here where we were talking about the relevancy, um, you know, as we said before, your search might pick up a lot of noise and you don't want that noise to affect um, your analysis. So if we look at it by relevancy, um, you see that, you know, in this example, XYZ LLC, although it got a lot of hits, um, when you take out the, you know, the non-relevant, the ones that are ranked low here in red, um, its portfolio shrinks quite a bit. Um, same thing with the U that's shown here. Um, and this, you know, can be done. I'm sorry. Um, I think that's it for this slide. So another um, analytic tool that we've used before is um, peers had mentioned it is, you know, claim scope ranking. Um, so this can be done both manually or you can use um, an automated um, tool as a proxy for it. So the automated one would be just the average words, for example, in claim one or the average number of words in the independent claim. And that can give you, uh, you know, a very rough indicator about the quality. Um, if you want more in depth, um, that would require a manual review of an attorney reviewing the claims and assessing their claim scope, you know, based on their experience, um, which is shown here of, you know, an attorney would have went through the claims and uh, ranked them according to the, you know, the perceived claim scope, whether it's a broad claims, medium claims, narrow claims. And here, you know, the attorney will use their judgment, you know, whether the claim is using a lot of means plus function language or whether, you know, it might have a lot of words, but the words don't really narrow the claims that much. So I'll, I'll uh, just throw in a, a note that last webinar, episode one, we talked about tools for automatically uh, determining the quality of the patent or, um, you know, value. Uh, value really. So if you want to learn more about how that can be done with automated tools, you can go back and listen to that webinar if you didn't hear it already. Great. Um, another thing um, that can help get the information that you want is something we call technology differentiation, um, where in a particular technology space, you break the portfolios down further by sub-technology groups. And we're, here we just have an example of, you know, suppose you define two sub-tech areas of sub-tech area one and sub-tech area two, and you categorize each company's portfolio by um, whether they are focused on either one or both or neither. So this can really help you show the focus of a company's portfolio in the technology space, whether they're directed to a particular, particular sub-tech area or not. 
Um, usually, like the subtech areas, uh, that information you would probably want to get from some subject matter experts or just based, you can try to come up with it based on your own review of the portfolio. And here um, we show another way of breaking down the portfolios by sub-technology groups. Um, again, this can be done using uh, manual tagging. Um, here we show a company's portfolio in different tech categories. And within those categories, we define it further by key features. Um, we also show how that company's portfolio compares to others in the same technology space um, in each of those tech categories and in, in, in each of those key features. Uh, it's been my experience to get this type of detailed information, you will most likely require some type of manual review and tagging. Um, I don't know if anyone has experience in trying to get at this level of information using automated techniques. So Adil, this is Steve Lundberg. So the, in this uh, uh, graph, um, the two different colors on the bar charts, one would be the most important claims and the other would be less valuable ones or what I just for the audience. Oh, no. Um, so the orange color are the company X's um, patents in the technology area, the key features. And the blue ones are other companies' patents in that same technology feature. Okay. So you can see a comparison of how company X's portfolio matches up with the other competitors. Very good. Uh, Thank you. Yeah, in this case, this would be against the entire landscape. You could also obviously break it down into specific companies or one company, et cetera. That's a great point. So if uh, you know your client is interested in seeing how their uh, portfolio matches up with a particular competitor, you can do this type of analysis and break it down into these different sub technologies and key features. So in this chart, if your uh, client was uh, company X with the oranges, they would be pretty dominant in the industry if the blue was the rest of the industry because they would have yep. some of these categories, a very good portion of the patents. Okay. Yeah. And it also shows where um, maybe they're lacking. For example, in the first electro position, you know, outside of the body, it, maybe that's, you know, just not part of their business profile. Uh, next slide, please. So there we were talking about landscape type analysis. You can also then use the data to do a more of a company level analysis. Um, here you organize the information um, per company. And this type of analysis really helps in trying to gain insight into a company's filing trend. Uh, for example, uh, in this graph that's shown here, you see that this particular company had a significant increase in their filings recently. So this may indicate that the company is focusing more resources to the target technology space in recent years. Next slide, please. And sometimes this can, be, this can be very revealing in terms of a company uh, strategy if, if uh, they're, they don't have any products in a space yet, but their patent filings are taking off, then you can uh, perhaps see some potential future product releases. Yep, that's a great point. And another thing to consider here is, um, you know, it might just be new filings or it might indicate a, an acquisition of some type that maybe they acquired um, another company. It wouldn't be shown in this graph, but if they, you know, if you see a large increase, um, you should maybe investigate that to see what the reason for that increase was. Did they um, acquire a company that was filing more in this space. Yeah, you know, uh, I guess I had a comment on this too, where I have seen on at least much more in recent years, um, patent acquisitions will sometimes show up in these um, analyses. And so you can see that someone bought a portfolio of patents or a number of patents from someone else and that usually speaks volumes to what they're concerned about or what their, you know, what their plans are. Very true. 
Well, I think we just got a question. The big recent drop is due to the 18 months patent publication delay. Yes, I think I think that would be the case in that previous slide. And um, oftentimes when we make these types of charts, we'll cut it off um, before that. But I think in that one, um, you know, at least one or two patents were getting picked up in 2019. So we had decided to keep that, uh, the 2019 in there. But that is something that you should take into consideration that this is based on printed publications and there's typically an 18 month delay there. Oh, next slide, please, Dan. And well, this is the last slide. So once you completed the analytics review, um, the SWOT analysis can be pretty straightforward. Um, you know, it really is the more work you do on the front end to properly define the project scope, refine the search strategy like we discussed and tailor your review strategy, um, the easier the SWOT analysis is going to be. Um, again, the SWOT is organized by strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, threats, uh, but I typically like to do it a little bit out of order and go clockwise starting from strengths and doing opportunities last. Because um, I really think the landscape and company level analysis that you've done will provide the information about the strengths, weaknesses, and threats. Uh, for example, you can look at the strengths of the company's portfolio. If they have a large portfolio, do they have a strong portfolio compared to other competitors in the area? And it can also tell you about their weaknesses. Is there, you know, a, a substantial amount of their portfolio about to expire? or expire soon? Do they have a high rate of abandonment? Um, their claim quality compared to their competitors or like their patent position with respect to a certain technology. And similarly, you do the same thing with threats based on the competitors and other players you see. You can identify possibly smaller new players um, emerging, or you can see how um, your primary competitor's portfolio matches up with yours. And then once you have identified the strengths, weaknesses, and threats, I think the opportunities kind of write themselves. You know, if you identify, um, you know, the high rate of abandonment, well, you can see an opportunity there of reducing the abandonment rate by possibly implementing more pre-filing screening. Or if you see that your claim scope is um, narrower than your competitors, uh, maybe an opportunity there is to target prosecution of key applications to at least improve the claim scope of those. Um, and then if you see that you have a weak patent position in a certain technology, and you also see a threat of, you know, smaller players um, and new players in that same technology, well, then you can maybe investigate partnership opportunities or maybe investigate, um, you know, uh, maybe uh, investing more resources into that technology to catch up. Uh, does anyone else have any thoughts of how they do their SWOT analysis? We have a question here. Uh, it says, how do you recommend managing foreign language content? Um, is machine translation good enough at the beginning of the process? I guess I can take that to kick it off. So, I mean, primarily for these analyses, we usually will use abstracts if it's a foreign uh, language patent. Um, and most of the time we focus our analysis around PCT filings, US filings, European filings, um, and less so uh, with patents held outside the, the US, but I have found machine translation does work extremely well. I mean, for getting a pretty good gist of what the, the patent covers. I don't know if anybody else has any comments on that. Steve, I do. Um, I would say machine translation is okay for the first pass, but in the mode you were talking about, Steve, where you're kind of weeding out 60 an hour or whatever, with machine translation, um, it may come down to 40 or 50. You, 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 if in doubt, you, you might keep it in the possibly relevant pile rather than putting it across and weeding it out. Um, when I was in-house, uh, it just so happened that Japan was a key area of art 
and they didn't necessarily file in Europe or PCT or the US where you could get the English language counterpart. Um, so we did use machine translation and it was really interesting because a key feature of a key patent of ours was um, an elastic element and I won't get into the weeds, but basically it would expand out and be able to retract inwards. The key prior art was stretchy. So that could only go out, but not come back. But the Japanese character for those concepts was exactly the same. So when it got to the real kind of microscope phase of the thing, that's where we had to go to, you know, human translations. But that first cut, I think that machine translations are really helpful. So there was a, another question, thanks, Pierce, that came in and talking about deduping and um, Robbie, maybe you could, this, this is an area where you've had a lot of experience deduping results. Do you want to say something about how you dedupe? Yeah, I would say um, kind of what you had just said, a lot of our focus has been on US for these types of projects, um, but we will, um, we have done where uh, we look at only one, the original family member to um, produce the analysis we've done where we've looked at continuations as well. So that kind of just um, depends on the scope of the project. The area that we were looking at, just the original filing, it was a huge pool of patents. So it was an easy way to limit the, the size of the pool. Uh, let me add to that a little bit too. This is Malena. Uh, so circling this question back to the previous question, you can also use the family information to find English language equivalents if you're looking at a foreign uh, language patent, if, the, if that English member exists in the family, and then kind of do your analysis that way. So you're eliminating uh, the language barrier. So that's another angle. I'll also add that sometimes deduping is helpful as in it can tell you a little bit about the, the value of that patent. If it has a lot of family members, you can kind of um, take that as a hint that that company um, has assigned that patent family a lot of value. And that might be a way to identify some key or notable patents. So I, I think we're uh, probably at a transition here then, Adil, and uh, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think what, you know, Adil's presentation really says SWOT analysis is really situational awareness of where you stand in, in comparison to your um, competitors or even just how your portfolio stacks up in general. So portfolio curation is an element of what you do when you do a SWOT analysis um, because when you decide what categories you're going to compare against, um, that's portfolio curation. That's dividing your portfolio into categories of patents. Um, it's dividing, you know, your your uh, portfolio maybe even to uh, categories of which products, you know, the patents pertain to, or which um, competitors the patents relate to. Um, it's really curation is just matching taking your patent portfolio and tagging it to match up with all the important um, categories and competitors and products that, um, that you have in your universe and the way you think about things. So you can go to the next slide. Um, so, you know, why do people do this? Well, a lot of times, um, you know, time goes on if you're, if you're in a company and maybe you've been getting patents and you haven't been curating them, you know, it usually comes a time when you go, geez, I really wonder how much, I, how many patents I have in these different um, categories, which companies they relate to, you know, competitors they relate to, and so on and so forth. And so either you do this um, like episodically, and usually that's what companies tend to do is every once in a while they look at their uh, portfolio and they realize that they haven't reorganized it for a while. And one thing that's constantly changing in the patent field is the value of patents that you have. They're not static assets like a lot of other things. 
they actually vary in value as time goes on. So, you know, day one, you have a patent filed. Um, you don't know if it's going to be issued as a good, ultimately as a good patent or not. You know, a year later, okay, this one found some prior art, not worth as much as I thought it was. Another one, get a patent issued, you don't have any use for it. Five years later, you realize it's a gem in your portfolio and it has tremendous value. So you constantly have to be looking through your portfolio and reassessing um, because it's not a one-time thing. So a lot of companies will do this on an ongoing basis, but typically they kind of get more interested in it on an episodic basis, like maybe once a year, they go, yeah, we should really go through and take a look at this again. But it's good to always have a pretty good idea of what's in your portfolio. Now you can go to the, the next, next slide. And it's, it's for the same reasons that Adil gave in his presentation. I mean, if you're aware of what in your portfolio, then you can take actions that could improve it or reduce your costs or whatever. Um, what we have found is the automated, you know, categorization of your patents for curation purposes is not very good. Um, industry codes don't really match up very well to typically the way patent counsel or even executives like to look at their IP assets. Um, Classes and subclasses don't match up very well many times. So you to get a really good, meaningful view of what you've got in your portfolio typically requires a custom um, categorization based on what's important to the company, what's important to the executives. Um, and Janelle is gonna talk about this more in a second, but what I'd like to say is that what we've learned through doing this many, many times is that you want the categories to be as simple as you can make them and still get the information you need because patents are of such a nature, those of you that work with them a lot realize they often fall into multiple different categories. So if you get too many categories, now you've got the same patent showing up in multiple different categories and pretty soon it's just really difficult to even remember how you categorized the previous patent. I've, I've seen attempts to categorize things done by companies where they had too many categories, they do it for the first time through, whoever did it the first time through understood what they were doing. A year later, other people are trying to do it and nobody can make any sense out of it. And within two years, the whole thing's abandoned. So keep it simple is my advice on that. Only to what you really need to know is should be the minimum categories you use or the maximum. Next slide. Um, so we're now turning it over to Janelle to take it from here. Go ahead, Janelle. Yeah, thank you, Steve. Um, in discussing patent curation, why do it? I think it's useful to take a trip down memory lane and uh, look at, uh, at how curation has been done uh, in the past and why it was done. And in uh, the pre-database uh, era, uh, the big thing that a company could do, the big thing was identify how many patents that it had. Uh, this was actually a huge job because uh, they were not located in a central place. So the company would have to contact uh, all of its, uh, uh, its uh, patent pro procurement companies, its maintenance companies in order to get the lists of patents. And, uh, and then in the days when it was possible to create a database, create a database of, uh, of patents that the company had. And the importance uh, for this uh, goes to money. Uh, uh, business units are always under pressure to justify their spend. And uh, in order to justify their spend on patents, they have to be able to show uh, higher management and investors uh, what they are getting for their money. So the first thing to show them is how many patents does a company have? And the second part of that would be what country are they in? So the early curation was first of all, just identifying the patents owned by the company. And then secondarily, you could identify the country of the patent, whether it was issued, pending, abandoned or expired. Uh, and uh, it, it, this could be in the form of a, of a code or a tag. 
So uh, every year or every quarter, the patent department can present, and this is still probably true, to senior management and investors, graphs and reports showing uh, how many patents were obtained, uh, maintenance fees by country, uh, and, and then how much it cost. And this is extremely useful information, but it doesn't really tell uh, the senior management whether the uh, patent procurement process and patent maintenance process covers uh, the actual products that the company makes or services that the company provides. Uh, so in this, uh, in this case, uh, uh, it's possible for companies then to go to the next degree of tagging, which is to tag patents and applications by business unit. Uh, next slide. Okay, so generate reports by business unit. And the, the one purpose of this, in addition to upper management now, is to provide business unit managers data regarding the patents and applications covering activities by project. So each patent and patent application is now tagged by a uh, project. And uh, in the area that I'm used to working in this, uh, in this aspect is consumer products. So uh, consumer products development are known by certain project names. And these are usually top secret names so that nobody has any idea of what the actual product is except the people working on it. Uh, but um, patents are tagged in accordance with those projects. Uh, and the projects may be directed to product or project, uh, product features. Um, uh, once patents begin to issue, special patents such as standard essential patents are identified. And tagging allows business unit managers to determine costs of patent protection by product. Thus, quarterly or annually, each business unit manager is able to provide to upper management and investors data regarding the spend on uh, each of their uh, product development or actually existing products, because that's also going to be represented by the, um, the, uh, the product uh, group and, uh, 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 and, and anything else that um, that, that could be useful. So uh, the, the business unit managers have a pretty good handle on what it costs and what they're doing and whether they're, uh, well, the next step is whether their patents actually cover the product or, or, or process. Next slide. Okay, the next uh, area of curation then is uh, uh, reports mainly for scientists, engineers, and inventors. And this really goes into the question of are uh, the patents we are procuring, do they cover the products that our company makes? And uh, uh, in this area, one very useful tool is the ClaimBot. And Piers is going to be uh, discussing the ClaimBot in greater detail. Another type of uh, identifier are um, inventors. Uh, curation can be done in order to identify experts within the companies. And these would be inventors by project uh, so that this data could be easily accessible by other inventors, scientists, and engineers. Uh, patent subject matter curation. Uh, it's possible here to use USPTO classes or internal tags. These types of reports are not likely to go to upper management, the very highest management, but they may go to the uh, business unit managers and they will certainly go to the uh, active me members of the working groups, the people who are actually making products uh, and services for the company. Next slide. Uh, and another area is competitive intelligence. As Piers will show you, the um, claim bot can actually be used uh, in the area of competitive intelligence by mapping uh, competitors' portfolio uh, in the ClaimBot software. Uh, and another very useful uh, form of data are the forward and backward citations. 
Uh, as Adil mentioned, backward citations are a little uh, sketchier as far as their value, but forward citations can uh, certainly show uh, who is drafting off of uh, company's inventions and uh, back, backward citations, who is the company drafting off of. And this can be extremely valuable uh, in terms of knowing in the future whether um, uh, your own company has a problem with uh, getting too close to another company's technology or whether another company is actually uh, getting way too close to, to your technology. Uh, next slide. Okay, and I'll turn it over to Piers now to discuss uh, uh, the, the claim bot. Thanks, Janelle, and hi, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, where, wherever you are. Um, yeah, I'd like to share with you some of my personal experiences with the claim bot tool. Um, I'm a fan of it. I use it a lot. Um, I think a key function or ability of this tool is to cast light on a whole bunch of uh, data or information that's pretty unwieldy. So if I could use an analogy, imagine you're in a dark basement and you want to know what's in the far corners over there. This, this tool will do that for you. Um, so what is it? It's, it's a vast, it's a repository for bodies of information. Um, and that body of information could be your own patents. It could be competitor patents. It could be a body of prior art. Doesn't really matter. But let's assume it's your own patents. Um, the input side, if you will, can be live. So you can add to that body by every time you file an application, say your client files, or if, if you're all the in-house counsel, you file apps or whatever, you keep adding to that sort of body on the left, so to speak. On the right, the output, this is what you're looking at. This is an example of an output. It's called a panoramic claim chart <laughs> for those in the know kind of thing. Um, and what I really love about this tool is you can use it to mine the information or tag the information in certain ways. And there's, there's a few examples here. So just to sort of set the scene, the various patents are in the columns on the right there that if you can see them, you know, patent this, patent that. Um, so that's how the patents are shown in this output. Um, and the tags or results are in the rows, um, which are labeled in the extreme left column. And you'll see essentially there's three types of tagging. There's what we call a tech category, technology category, um, and then a bit further down scope concepts. And then a bit further down the last one, keywords. Now, um, the usual one is this tech category where you say, well, you might have seen it in an earlier slide, you know, um, where, are, where the, the categories ideal was pointing out, you know, where the med device tools, okay, this one's, uh, where's the pain? You know, is it a, is it a head worn thing? Is it a body worn thing? Is it a surgical uh, instrument? That sort of thing. So those would be examples of tech categories. So let's take tech category number one. Um, and this is where it's shining light on what you have in this vast body of information. You know immediately I've got 62 patents in that tech category. That's the second column. And for each patent that covers or relates to that tech category, that's marked dark blue. So that's one sort of easy way, if you will, or, 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 or far-reaching way you, 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 you can categorize your information. The next few tags are importance or ranking. So high, medium, low, those would relate to the um, charts that you were showing about ranking. This could also be, for example, an Alice ranking, a 101 ranking or a detectability ranking. It doesn't really matter. I've just set some examples here of, of importance. Um, and again, the salient patents are identified by the dark blue cell, if you will, across the spreadsheet. Where I really like this tool, and I wish I had it when I was in-house, uh, where we had a portfolio of over 6,000 patents, and you, you just <laughs> you wonder what you've got in there, and, and you need to get your hands on it quickly. I have had a situation where the CEO would come in and say, hey, we've just been sued by our biggest competitor. What have we got to hit back? Um, so where it's listed primary product, primary product to all that stuff, you can tag your patents or your competitors' patents, but usually it might be, it'll be yours. Um, 
that read onto your own product. Um, so you can see what coverage you, you have for, for a given product. Now, this is particularly useful if you're doing directed prosecution. Um, directed prosecution is where, as you're examining a case, you don't just amend to get over the prior art, but you make sure that any element you're adding still reads onto your product or still reads onto a competitor's product that you're trying to tag. Um, and so this can be live and dynamic as, 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 as your whole portfolio is being prosecuted, you can kind of keep an overview or a periscope right here of, 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 of what's going on. Um, and you can have various levels of, of granularity, you know, secondary product, et cetera, et cetera. Um, some of that, if not all of it, might be manually created, usually will be. And that's again, what I love about this tool. It's kind of semi-automated, if you will. It gets a bunch of stuff done automatically, but you or a human does the sort of fine bit or the, or the, or the, or the, or the mapping, um, which I'll get to a little bit in scope concepts further down. Um, but the one say that Rob helps me with a lot, Rob stands on the, on, on the call. You know, if you just want to know what's allowed, what's granted, what's pending, that's all there. And the, and the, and the patents are, are tagged accordingly. Scope concepts are also interesting because you can map the data um, using this tool. Um, and scope concepts are usually like a combination of, of, of elements. So here, the first one, batch ingestion of data, that's concept number one, using a remote device or something, concept number two. And they're analogous to claim elements, but we kind of massage them. So they're um, more generic in some sense. That's why we call them scope concepts and they can be filtered and sorted in, in a number of ways. And again, you can see what patents have claims directed to those broad concepts flagged to the right. Uh, and there's 42 of the one kind and 21 of, of the other. The keywords one to me is another kicker feature. Um, I just love this because Bear in mind, I know it's called claim bot, but it, 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 it's not just limited to claims. And there was a question earlier about specifications. And I see a questions just come in about NPL, non-patent literature. You can stick whatever you like in this body of information. Um, but we're finding in Silicon Valley, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of movement between companies of, of skilled personnel. And you might have also been aware of... Um, pretty high profile litigation of, you know, employees stealing this information or that information. So some of the companies are sensitive about who they're about to employ. And you can look at their resume. I won't go into any details. I'll just give you a broad overview. Um, if you want to get a quick and rough idea of whether employee A, who may have worked on batch ingestion, is either going to be a help or potential conflict in such an area, you can hit this uh, body of data with a keyword called batch ingestion, filtering, hydration, doesn't matter, and quickly see what we have got on that area. Kind of keep that in the back of our minds as we, as we, as we research the new employee further and, and, and can tell, no, look, absolutely clear, or there's a bit of overlap, or heck, no, this, this could be a problem or, or whatever. So I love this tool. I really think it's helpful. Um, Oftentimes I've just wanted to know what's in our portfolio, what's out there, what's allowed. You, you can imagine there's many ways of using it. Um, and it's, it's generated in a user-friendly way, I find. Um, sometimes these spreadsheets are somewhat large, but you can sort of contract and hide rows and columns and so forth to, 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 to get at what you need. Um, so for example, if you're doing an FTO exercise, and you were in sort of Steve mode where you're kicking out 60 an hour, just hide each row, boom, 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 the whole thing contracts. Um, and you say, okay, I've got 20 left, boom, 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 down you go to five. Okay, let's get the microscope out now. We've got five left. Um, what do these claims really say, et cetera, et cetera. So I hope that gives you something of an overview. Um, I'm not sure I've missed anything out, but if you have any questions, please shout or others on the call, Steve, uh, please chime in. Well, thanks, Pierce. No, I, I think you've done a good job of, of describing that. And I think the a little bit of the backstory on that in the minute or so we have left, uh, or we're pretty much out of time, but the uh, firm developed this tool going back probably close to 15 years now. And it's an extremely capable tool 
that can do many, many different things. But Robbie Stans is an expert in using this. And uh, we basically call up Robbie, go, hey, load 500 patents into ClaimBot because we need to uh, analyze them. So, and but it, it's not just, a, it's not a primarily an analytics tool, although it does have analytics built into it, but it's it's really a tool that people can use to go through patent portfolios very quickly and sort and analyze content. So it's really a, a tool that, a, you know, it's more like a chainsaw, you know, than it is a, a robot just trying to cut trees down. Um, it's really for people to cut trees down faster, if you will. So anyways, with that, uh, I'd like to thank everybody today for their um, listening in. We've got um, one question about how do you get access to ClaimBot? Unfortunately, ClaimBot is not, uh, it is proprietary to, to uh, SLW. We have had clients use it from time to time and we're all happy to let clients use it, but it's a very complex tool and it's not uh, you know, really something you can just kind of wander in and use. Um, and then uh, every once in a while, it really requires a lot of training. There are other tools out there that I would recommend to you if you're looking for something and uh, Clearstone IP has got a, a tool that is it can do some things that are similar to ClaimBot, uh, or at least a couple features of ClaimBot. Um, doesn't really uh, do the, the broad range of things ClaimBot does, but you might want to contact them. A uh, great company. Um, and there's a couple more questions. See if I can. There gets one more. I guess it's just. That was it. So anyways, thanks to all the presenters today. Thanks everybody for listening in. And Michelle, do you want to uh, give everybody the, the uh, what's com coming next, please? Sure. The third episode of the Analytics How To Webinar Series will take place on April 22nd when we examine how to make and use FTO maps and analysis, product coverage analysis, and maps. And you can find these registration pages on the SLW Institute on the SLW website. And please keep an eye out for the email invitations as well. Thank you again for joining us and be well.